Well, good afternoon and welcome to the second webinar of the DLFE Research Network. Today's topic is data management needs. Uh, this is Rita Van Dynen and I'm your moderator for today's session. Before we get started, there's just a few uh, housekeeping items I need to mention. Um, today's webinar uh, will consist of our guest speaker, Kathleen Fear. We'll have some time for Q&A. We'll then uh, review our group activity slides and have discussion about those and um, just wrap it up with a few housekeeping items. And if you'd like to tweet about today's session, you can use the hashtag eResearchNetwork and the mention at ClearDLF. So for those of you presenting today, audio is accessible by either conference call line or by voice over IP. Uh, and the dial-in number is uh, there in the chat window for your convenience. Um, you can use that chat window to type in any kind of comments or questions throughout the session. And if any, uh, at any time during today's webinar you experience technical difficulties, you can send me a private chat so that I can troubleshoot with you. You just mouse over my name and click on the private chat option, or you can also send me an email and I will post my email address in the chat window uh, in just a moment. Also know that uh, you can exit and re-enter -ex re the webinar at any time. Um, joining us today are our eResearch Network faculty members, Jason Clark from the Montana State University and Kendall Rourke from the University of Alberta. Okay, so today's guest speaker is Kathleen Fear. Kathleen is the data librarian at the University of Rochester's River Campus Library, Libraries and leads the Numeric Spatial and Research Data Services team. She joined the libraries in 2013 and before that was a doctoral student at the University of Michigan studying data archiving and reuse. In her current role, she is responsible for supporting faculty, students, and staff at the university in their data management practices and to foster their appreciation of all things data related. Kathleen was also a member of the University of Rochester institutional team for the 2014 cohort of the eResearch uh, Network. Um, I will just pause here to, to remind you that if you are um, using the conference call line and you're not speaking if at all possible, uh, if you could mute your phone before Kathleen begins. Okay, with that, Kathleen, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Rita. Um, so I'm going to be talking this week about assessing data management needs, um, as well as towards the end, some uh, sort of tools for helping with data management planning. Um, so I uh, asked you to take a look at the ARL spec kit um, uh, and the information there about assessing data management needs, um, mostly because I think it's, it's sort of a nice cross section of uh, what you see institutions typically doing when they're trying to figure out what uh, data management needs their, their uh, researchers have. Um, so, um, and what, what I'm going to be talking about today is, you know, sort of um, approaches that you can take, um, how to devise a, a data management needs assessment um, sort of scheme, um, and some alternative sources of information that you can look at. Um, so, you know, if you look around at what folks are doing, typically you see a lot of surveys, um, surveys of faculty, surveys of students, surveys of uh, researchers of all stripes, um, uh, in addition to interviews based often on the data curation profiles or, or sort of adapted to something much shorter and easier to uh, um, administer. But you know, mostly all geared towards identifying gaps around research data management um, with an eye towards figuring out how to design services to fill those gaps, or perhaps to make a case to administration, whether the library administration or campus administration for support of some sort around data management, um, whether that's uh, sort of infrastructure or money or staff or, or any other kind of support. Um, or also to kind of put together sort of a rallying point for stakeholders, um, draw together all the folks who have a stake in research data management and, and uh, start doing some activity. Um, so what's interesting, I think, uh, with all this work is that, you know, at this point, many, many libraries have engaged in this kind of activity. Uh, and many libraries have also published uh, what their findings were. 
And I think, uh, you know, looking at all those things, you start to see that, you know, although every institution is different, of course, and every uh, researcher is different, there are some really common needs uh, that emerge. Almost everybody's results look, uh, you know, if not exactly the same, they look pretty similar. Um, and, you know, for the life of me, I cannot figure out where I heard somebody say this, but uh, it's, it's stayed with me, um, that, you know, they and others have found through their data management assessment that the things that researchers are looking for are places to put things, ways to point to things, and help organizing things. Um, and that was certainly the case when we uh, did our work here at Rochester. Um, so one thing to think about when engaging in data management needs assessment is, you know, you're, you're sort of not starting from scratch. At this point, there's been enough exploration going on that I think going in, you can uh, kind of start with a pretty reasonable hypothesis about what kind of things you're going to see when you start talking to uh, your researchers. And so that means, I think, it, it, it's sort of extra important to uh, sort of acknowledge that you're not starting from scratch and really think about um, what your own needs and goals in doing this assessment are. Uh, so what do you hope to do with the data that you gather? Um, you know, are you doing a needs assessment primarily to look to try to identify, uh, you know, the, the places to concentrate your effort in putting together a new service? Um, or are you trying to look for evidence or, you know, to justify a new position within the library relating to data or a realignment of, of uh, people's time around these kinds of activities, that kind of thing. Um, and then think about, you know, what kind of data will be actionable for those purposes? Um, you know, because different, different uh, types of assessment will give you different kinds of data, which then you can use for sort of different purposes. Um, you know, if, if you start from the common approaches, either surveys or interviews, they have different strengths. Um, surveys are pretty wonderful in that you can uh, get data from a lot of researchers very quickly. Um, and they're especially effective for producing sort of clear targeted statistics about data management needs. You know, X percent of faculty said that they would be interested in having an institutional repository that can accept data, that kind of thing. Um, you know, and so if, if you're looking toward communicating with uh, campus administration, that sort of um, almost soundbite around data uh, can be really effective. Um, versus doing interviews, which are, you know, are a much more time-consuming, uh, somewhat labor-intensive thing to do, but the, the trade-off is that you get a really in-depth understanding of researchers, their data, and their context of work. Context of work. Um, interviews can be especially effective as sort of a, a, a first um, mode of outreach around uh, data uh, as part of your needs assessment because they are so flexible and adaptable if you use sort of a semi-structured um, protocol because, you know, the first few times that you're out there talking about data, you often have to do a lot of work to kind of find common ground um, with researchers and help them understand what the library uh, is sort of doing, um, uh, thinking about data, uh, and interviews are a really good opportunity to, to do that. Um, for us at Rochester, when I came in, um, the library had been doing a fair bit of work already uh, around data um, and had done a few interviews already. So we were thinking, um, you know, really the, the survey would be uh, the best place to go, you know, because the library is pretty on board. Um, we really wanted to start communicating with um, the rest of campus, particularly the administ administration, and even think about uh, you know, drawing together a, a working group or a task force or something comprised of folks from different parts of the university to, to start thinking about uh, data management strategy kind of writ large. Um, so, so that's the direction that we went. But um, more than just sort of matching your method to what you hope to get out of the survey, you also need to think about uh, kind of the larger institutional context. Uh, and so that is something that we did not do. Um, and it, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you about how it affected us. Um, so I think, you know, when you're thinking about your institutional context and the kind of assessment that you're going to do within that context, um, I think two really important pieces to think about are first the uh, sort of size and diversity of research at your institution, as well as the institutional culture. So for us, you know, we, we spent some time putting together the survey, and I think it was a pretty good survey, and we got buy-in from a bunch of departments, and. Uh, uh, really kind of shopped it around to make sure that we were going to maximize our response rate. Um, and then we 
fielded the study uh, and responses started rolling in. We had a decent re uh, response rate, but the reality is we actually have a really pretty small number of researchers um, in total. You know, on this side of campus, we only have, um, I think, a little over 300 faculty. And so, you know, we got somewhere between a 15 and 20 percent response rate, which is decent, but you know, numerically, that's, it, it only worked out to between 40 and 50 people, which is enough to get um, a, a sort of a signal on, on some of the questions that we asked, but it really limited our ability to kind of slice and dice the data. You know, when you start dividing out the scientists from the engineers, from the humanists, to look at the specific needs of those communities, um, we really sort of lost, um, uh, it, 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 it wasn't as good of an opportunity um, as it could have been. Um, but you know, we analyzed our results and we took a look at what we had and put together a report and started shopping it around uh, to our campus administration. Um, had a meeting with the deans and stuff. Uh, without sort of thinking about the fact that here at Rochester, we are a, a very bottom up culture. Um, so while our results were well received um, by the administration, everybody thought it was very interesting you know, our, our campus is just not one where uh, something like a working group or task force is going to come together. Uh, so, you know, the our, our outcome from the survey survey wasn't really matched to what, the kind of thing that was a real possibility here. Um, whereas, you know, if you if you are part of an institution where um, you know that kind of thing is more common, that would be a much more effective way to go. So that's not to say that like the survey was a totally lost opportunity. It was just, um, you know, I think if we had uh, thought a little bit more about how our work fit into the bigger picture of the university, I think we could have gotten a lot more bang for our buck. You know, particularly since we were small, if we had put that time into more interviews, um, you know, I think I think we might might have moved along a little quicker. Um, so let's see. So yeah. So surveys and interviews, um, they are great because you're getting out there, you're talking to your researchers, and you're finding out what they um, think that they need. And so we did that. And uh, but um, sorry, I'm losing track of my notes. Uh, so we responded to the things that we saw that they needed, um, and we also you know, started doing some initiatives around things that, uh, you know, we know are important. So we offer workshops, we offer consultations and things, a lot of stuff targeted to sharing your data. Uh, and what we found was not a lot of uptake. Um, so when we were talking to people, we were getting sort of two, two flavors of response. You know, we were offering these things to teach you about sharing your data and people were saying, oh, no, I already do it. Uh, you know, it's, it's fine. I already uh, have it all taken care of. Um, or we had people saying, you know, it, it doesn't actually apply to me. I don't have to share my data. Um, and so these are things that, you know, we uh, can strongly hypothesize are, are not actually true. Um, you know, we know that there are a lot of people who uh, have to share their data at our university, and we suspect that they may not be doing it as effectively as they can uh, or, or may not be doing it uh, at all necessarily. So sometimes, you know, uh, researchers are, are, are not the optimal source of data, I guess, about, about their own needs. So how do you go about finding out what researchers don't know that they need? Um, for this, we, we look at sort of external sources of information about data-related needs. Um, the big one that we focused on, um, and if anybody was at RDAP this year, you heard me talk about this project. Um, we, we wanted to look at uh, where our faculty were publishing and what data sharing policies they were sort of uh, falling under um, and how well that they were complying um, with those things. So uh, what we did was uh, we took a look at Web of Science, um, just because for us it has pretty decent coverage, um, looked at the journals that our faculty were most commonly publishing in, kind of evaluated the journal data sharing policies uh, and tried to figure out, you know, were they sharing the data in accordance with policies or not? So you can see some of our results below. I don't, I don't know if I have a way to point to anything here, uh, but you know, if you look at the graph, so the the darker blue bars 
are uh, the proportion of articles in those journals that didn't share data at all. The lighter blue is uh, they shared data, uh, but maybe not optimally. And uh, the grayish blue is the proportion that shared data sort of as optimally as we uh, would hope. So, you know, this kind of gave us a sense of uh, where there was a gap that researchers may not actually know about. Um, either, you know, they're not aware of the policies that they're supposed to be complying with, or they don't know how to do it uh, particularly well. Um, so these are opportunities, I think, for, for us to do some really targeted outreach. Um, our next step here is myself and um, some of the subject librarians are going to uh, do some really, uh, like I said, targeted outreach around uh, particular journals, particular departments, uh, particular repositories, and try to, you know, it make them aware uh, that this is something that they need, um, and then give them the information that they need in order to comply. Um, another place that we've looked at uh, is talking to our granting office, uh, getting records uh, sort of on a yearly basis of the proposals that are uh, awarded, submitted, and rejected through our grant office. Um, this sort of is, is helpful in two ways. One is to just kind of keep abreast of um, who people are applying to for funding. Um, as you know, funders are sort of uh, continually adding to their requirements. Um, and so we want to make sure that we are in the loop on that and can advise uh, faculty accordingly. Um, we've also done some work around uh, identifying folks with rejected proposals and sort of getting back in touch, seeing if they're uh, revising and, and resubmitting those proposals, and is there anything that we can do around their data management planning uh, for those things. So, you know, um, I think uh, another important piece about uh, needs assessment is really that I, I, I don't think it's a thing that ever really ends. Um, you know, we found that we offer services um, and they sort of bring people in but what keeps them coming back is the relationships that we build. Um, you know, we, we've run into a couple of times where you know you, you do a data management uh, consultation, help somebody to put together a plan, and then you know they have a template that they're going to use the next time. They don't get back in touch, um, and they pass that template around to the rest of the department. So then we don't, you know, those people don't come in. Um, and so I think it really needs to be an iterative process where you know you identify the initial gap put together a service to fill the gap and offer that service. And in that process, build relationships with users and non-users, which in turn sort of tell you more about the things that they need. Um, so sort of uh, uh, keeping that process going. I, I've been kind of thinking about it as like uh, figuring out what data service needs exist on campus is, is sort of like the longest reference interview uh, that you'll ever do. You know, because you can imagine sort of the, the, the classic situation where somebody comes to you with a question, uh, you know, and you can see that their question is really related to like 15 other things uh, that they don't even know to ask about. Um, and so, so that's sort of the, uh, the, the mindset, I guess, around uh, data services here is, you know, there's, there are many things that people don't know that they need um, and that we may not be able to offer now, but we can later on and if we kind of keep these relationships going, that's, that's what we can build on. Um, and I do see uh, data management consultation as, as sort of a core piece of that ongoing needs assessment. Um, you know, it's, it's partly a service for researchers, but it also serves um, as a really important opportunity to kind of continue to identify needs. Um, so initially when I was putting together this talk, um, you know, the prompt was to talk about tools for uh, helping researchers with data management plans, but then I sort of thought about what we offer here, um, and, and we don't actually do a ton with tools. Um, you know, we do offer the DMP tool with customization, but the most effective thing that I found is really this sort of low-tech, high-impact approach, which is I have a handout which walks people through uh, the process of doing a data management plan, and we sit down together and talk about it. Um, you know, because the, the conversation really unlocks much more um, than just pointing them to the DMP tool or something like that. So really, I find that the most effective tools around uh, data management planning assistance are the tools for me uh, to help me provide a, a better consultation services. 
Um, so we'll just talk about these um, a little bit and then that'll be it. Uh, so I have uh, what I call sort of my who does what list, uh, which are uh, all the people around the university who provide services and guidance related to data. Uh, this is sort of a schematic of, of uh, kind of how I think about data services on our campus that, you know, we really sit uh, kind of at the nexus of all of these different groups on campus. Um, you know, the individual departments and their faculty and their students. And in our case, some of the departments have their own uh, sort of systems administrators and IT infrastructures. Um, there's also campus IT and the High Performance Computing Center and all the sort of administrative folks, the grants and contracts, the Office of Research, the IRB, um, the Dean for Research, and all those kinds of folks. Um, and so I think a, a, a really key role that, that we play uh, overall, as well as in, in these kind of consultative services, is the, the ability to connect people to other people who can do the pieces that they need. Um, so for example, if I'm talking to a chemistry researcher and we're putting together a data management plan for him, and he needs to think about storage of his data during his active project, it's really important to bring in uh, the chemistry sysadmin um, to make sure that you know we all understand what uh, sort of good data management will look like in that context, uh, what is possible given uh, kind of the IT infrastructure in the department and the university, um, and kind of build an ongoing relationship between all of us. Um, a second piece, um, you know, I think there's, when you're consulting on a data management plan, there's sort of a constant implicit question about why. Uh, why they have to do this, why it's, you know, not just another hoop uh, to jump through and that kind of thing. Uh, so I like to kind of have in my back pocket uh, data stories, horror stories and good stories. Um, and this uh, data stories um, project uh, uh, is run by um, actually Ina Cooper, who was uh, one of the uh, clear fellows for this group last year, um, sort of collecting crowd stores stories about um, good and bad data management. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I kind of have my arsenal of uh, stories that happen locally, but it, it can be helpful to uh, take a look at what happens elsewhere as well. And the last piece, um, so this is this is a project that I'm involved with, so I'll kind of plug it here. Um, it's not live yet, but it will be, um, and I think it'll be super useful. Uh, DataQ is going to be a collaborative platform and a community sort of aimed at addressing research data questions in academic libraries. So it'll be a forum where uh, you know, if you have a question about data management or about, um, you know, being a data librarian or about developing data services, that kind of thing, you can submit it. Um, the editorial board will kind of crowdsource an answer and review it and publish it, um, and it should be a really pretty awesome resource. Uh, so like I said, it's not live yet, uh, but it will be. Um, I think it should be this summer, um, and you can kind of check in with them on Twitter at ResearchDataQ for now. Um, so I think that is all I've got. I think I'm out of time. Thank you, Kathleen. Are there questions or comments for Kathleen? Um, if so, feel free to type them in the chat box or speak up um, either by phone or by um, voice over IP. Um, oh, I see the ones in there. In their yeah, family. go ahead and um, go ahead, Kathleen. Okay. Uh, so Donna's question. Um, was it hard to get access to the proposals? Uh, for us, it, it was, um, well, yes and no. Um, so we have not actually been able to get access to the proposals themselves. Um, what we did get was uh, they were able to do um, sort of a data dump of all the statistics. So we don't have the proposals, but we have you know names, titles, dates submitted, award amount, um, and a, a status, and a, and a bunch of other fields. Um, so, uh, you know, it was enough to do um, kind of the analysis of who's applying where and what departments and that kind of thing. But yeah, it's, I, I would like to get like the actual data management plans and things, but that's been much more of an issue. Um, and was it our main office? Yes, it was. Uh, so we have one uh, kind of campus-wide grant office and they were able to give us um, records for, for everybody. Uh, what is what is my definition of a gap? Were there different types of gap, resources, skills, infrastructure? Um, 
Yeah, so definition of a gap. Um, I guess I sort of use gap synonymously with like opportunity. Um, any place where it seems like there's a need for uh, a need that a researcher has that either the library could fill directly uh, through development of a service or kind of indirectly by serving as a pointer to another um, group on campus that already fills um, or that already provides a service. Uh, were there different types of gaps, resources, skills, infrastructure? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, infrastructure, our biggest gap is uh, storage and repository. Um, we, we really, we have an institutional repository. It's not great for data. We have a lot of work with lot, big data going on and not a lot of um, ability to handle it. Um, skills, for sure, um, particularly around students, um, training and data management skills. And also, you know, our, our assessment sort of brought up a bunch of issues around, um, you know, data acquisition and data analysis and all these sort of um, skills that are related to data management, um, but not necessarily within our purview. Um, and resources, uh, always, um, you know, people need people to help uh, with data management is probably the biggest resource gap. And unfortunately, I mean, th there's only a limited amount that we can do. Is there a motivation gap? Will agencies audit compliance with plans? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, it's, it's interesting. I think for right now, most of the people that I'm talking with um, maybe haven't gotten to the motivation gap yet. They're anxious enough um, and have little enough experience with writing data management plans um, that they're just sort of motivated through anxiety here because they don't know what to expect. Um, I, it's the folks who are, are in sort of their second and third round who've gotten proposals back with, you know, no comments on the data management plan, no feedback at all that really start to feel like this is maybe kind of pointless. Um, and that ties to the second question, will agencies audit compliance with plans? I, I haven't seen that at all. Uh, the slides show the central data services to which the library is linked. Despite being a bottom-up institution, were you able to establish a cross-campus data services group? No, our data services group is uh, purely within the library. Um, you know, I have a lot of uh, sort of informal relationships with folks in all those areas, but you know, that it, it really is informal and relies on uh, me, me kind of knowing who's out there and reaching out to them. Yeah, I think it'll be really interesting to see how compliance evolves. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't be surprised uh, for NIH to be kind of the first to lead the way on this. Okay, are there other questions or comments for Kathleen? Um, if so, feel free to just keep the conversation going in the chat window and uh, we'll move forward with the rest of our session. Um, I do want to take a moment to thank Kathleen for joining us today. It was um, great to hear from you. And if you have a moment, Kathleen, and you have a link to your RDAP slides, um, feel free to post them in the chat window here or you can email them to me and I can put them in Clear Connect. But thank you again. Oh, sure. Thank you for inviting me. It was Morning a us. pleasure to speak to you all. So for the next um, half of today's session, we will um, cover our group activity. So prior to today's webinar, we asked each of you to take a look at our initial survey responses on research data management services, and then using a peer review process, share with the rest of the group your insights into RDMS at the institution you were assigned to review. 
So you were asked to identify a need or opportunity and to list two recommendations for successfully building research data, data management services. So Caltech is up first, and they uh, reviewed responses from the University of Florida. And uh, Donna, are you with us? Okay, Donna's going to call in, so we'll just pause here for a moment. Thank you, Kathleen, for posting that link. Okay, Donna, is that you? Hey, can you guys hear me? We can hear you just fine. Go right ahead. Okay, great. Um, okay, sorry, too much technology here. Um, okay, so we uh, had, the, I would say, the distinct pleasure of going uh, evaluating UF efforts so far, and um, I do apologize for the brevity of the slides. It was um, a little bit late last night. I was looking through just the incredible amount of work that they've done. Um, so I, I think it's probably fair to say that, that UF is probably at the head of the group here. And um, uh, I do remember when uh, this team was actually being formed back in 2012. Um, I was asked to be on it, but was unfortunately at the time transitioning to my new position. Um, they've done a lot of documentation. They've got a website up. They've got a lot of stuff posted in, in the institutional repository. And uh, one thing that I found when looking through the survey responses um, I'm not sure how much time I have. I'm going to shoot for maybe like a few, just four or five minutes here. Um, survey responses, um, because of everything that they've done, um, I, you know, the survey to me didn't seem super um, elucidating or, or, or illuminating of, of what's been going on. So I decided to poke around um, in, in, the, um, in the IR, in the institutional repository, and, you know, sort of looked at, you know, what the latest stuff has been going on. And the two documents that, that I kind of, uh, dug into were um, the data draft policy guidelines version 14, and I provided the link there. And this was the latest one that I could find. This was dated April 27, 2015, um, so right after RDAP. Um, and I found a uh, a year one report. So I think the committee and Hannah, please please correct me if I'm if I'm incorrect on any of this. Um, the, the team, I think, was commissioned late 2012 and I think really kind of got rolling uh, beginning in 2013. So at the end of 2013, I found that there was a year one report. Um, I was curious to know if there was a year two report. I kind of poked around but didn't see anything. Um, OK, um, next slide. OK, so most of my uh, comments really, I, I tried to frame them in terms of opportunities or recommendations. but. Um, you know, I feel like anything that I would think of, you know, oh, hey, are you guys, oh, yes, there it is. It's in that, it's, it's right there in that, in, the, in, that, in that document. Um, but so I kind of thought about some more questions um, that, you know, if, there's, if it's possible to share even more stuff and, you know, not to, you know, not, not to, to pick on you guys for not sharing enough because I think, again, the resources that you, you've shared and put in the IR are just absolutely fantastic and I highly recommend um, everybody take a look at that. Um, what I what I thought was interesting uh, what was I know that that y'all had done um, a campus environmental scan essentially, and I was kind of looking, and you mentioned doing that in the year one report, and I was kind of looking for if if there was any sort of summary results or 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 conclusions that were kind of based out of that, and you know UF is a very I, I think it's probably similar uh, to um, the other institutions here more than it is to us because of our you know, very, very narrow, distinct focus, not only just on science and engineering, but on specific aspects of science and engineering, you know. So we have a biology division, but nobody touches, nobody really does environmental stuff or, or ecology stuff or anything like that. So, um, so for us, for, for us personally, what would be useful would be to take a look at, you know, if you've got any response for unique needs for like, say, you know, the engineers wanted this, but the chemists wanted that, you know, or as opposed to, you know, the social scientists wanted this, or the humans wanted that. Um, and maybe an example of, of you know, if, if you've gotten to this yet, if you haven't, that's totally cool, and I'd be curious to know if it's in the works. Um, you know, the DMP tool adaptation that, that y'all worked on, 
um, you know, sort of what's the flexibility of that in terms of looking at different types of data? You know, um, you know I'm, and I kind of approach this with my bias as a scientist, and I'm sure that many others in this group may have this as well, where, you know, I think about, uh, uh, I guess, materials data or chemistry data. And, you know, data management, you're basically talking about, you know, digital data. Um, or in biology, for example, you know, you may be talking about specimens or, you know, you know, how does that, you know, sort of translate and, and, and what are the, what are those different things that are of importance to different researchers? Is it important to keep actual samples or, or what's the metadata or the data that comes from that that you need to keep? Um, and, and, you know, UF I think is, is, you know, is so broad that, you know, there could be templates for pretty much every uh, you know, almost every research area. So I'd be very curious to see, you know, if, if you've been able to sort of drill down. I know, and I know, I, I know from reading the reports that that y'all did a lot of interviews and targeted uh, targeted work with different groups, and I did see that. And the documents that you presented, understandably, to get policy moving, are very broad. But if there was any way to share any of that more specific information that that y'all collected, that would be great. Um, and you know, again, speaking to the broadness, working with the division of sponsored programs, um, which I think, which I, I saw in there that you guys are doing, and you know, the best practices document I think really nicely addresses the three different groups, uh, the main three groups that you've identified. In other words, the library, the researchers, obviously first, um, the computing center, and the library, and sort of what are the roles that each of those three groups you know need to play, and you know, as those three being the key groups that are um, uh, involved in this, you know, so supporting best practices. The idea of, of buy-in for a campus-wide data policy, um, you know, from the top down, you know, and UF being institution, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, listening to Kathleen talk um, and, and hearing, you know, that, that Rochester is a very bottom-up institution, and I feel it's exactly the same at Caltech. It's almost like the polar opposite of, <laughs> of UF, where, you know, you have a large public university. There's a lot of uh, government mandates, state mandates that you have to go along with that. So the idea of there being a campus-wide data policy, I'm, 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 I'm completely fascinated with, with how, that's, how that's progressing and how that's going to come about, because, you know, UF is one of those places where you could actually get away with that. <clears throat> And how would that type of policy, I guess, drill down, you know, again to divisional support? You know, do you have any case studies, you know, or, or do you plan on getting case studies for that? Um, you know, I, I, again, I guess most of my comments and most of my, my uh, interest is kind of focused on, on drilling down to specific areas because for our institution that would be the most helpful. You know, if, if that makes any if that makes any sense. Um, that last link that I I, I just found there while I was noodling around, and it's um, in the Computer and Information Science and Engineering Department at UFL, and it's a, a Data Science Research Department. I was just kind of curious if, if, if you all had done any work with them, because um, it seems like that's sort of right up the alley of all of this. Um, I didn't see that group specifically mentioned, but maybe you guys had off the record uh, communications with them, so I just figured I'd mention that. But anyway, um, yeah, no, great job, and thank you for sharing everything. and, and you know, at least for us, I found it, you know, super helpful and, and just, just wonderful to read about all the great work that you're doing. Thanks. So this is Hannah. Are we supposed to be responding as well, or is it mostly just each group talking to, reporting back? Uh, I can't hear Rita, but... No, I can't either. Somebody's typing. Okay. Okay. Um, so thanks, Donna, for all the lovely shout-outs. Um, so I think it... I, so I guess... So we don't have our environmental scan results in the IR. That one was one that we did a couple years ago, so I'm not remembering myself. Um, but that's something we could easily put in. I don't know that we've done, I mean, our main takeaway from that was that everything is so diverse at UF and we have so many, um, so many different needs that we just need to kind of move forward. Um, so we didn't, I don't think we have any document that breaks down the analysis by particular um, divisions or disciplines, but um, we can certainly put up the data itself and then if you see anything of interest in there um, for you, then you could 
find that yourself. Um, as far as the DMP tool goes, we've just done some very basic customization, um, and we and so since we could essentially do a template for every research area, that's been a little bit overwhelming to uh, begin with, and um, we kind of need the liaisons in each area to to take the stab at that. Um, so that is definitely something for us to work on in the future. Um, uh, our best practices document, that is the most recent version. I have um, some edits that I need to make to it now. So the way that we've kind of gone forward with that is that this is a document that's come out of our data management and curation task force, which has representation from our research computing and sort of from the Office of Research as well as the libraries. Um, and it's been bouncing back a fair bit between the library administration um, and the task force before it goes out more broadly. But our idea is that it goes out also um, to the IT leadership um, and then also through faculty senate, essentially getting input from anybody with an interest in this area before we actually have a policy. So the document is called Data Management Guidelines and Best Practices for Research Data Policy Development. So um, the idea that we have is that we're probably going to need to have a policy. I mean. Um, that funders are probably going to require that there be more specific policies in the future. And so we'd like to kind of be ahead of that curve and hopefully not have to um, kind of patch something to, something together at the last minute. Um, and so we're trying to do that ahead of time and get um, input ahead of time. And so while we are doing it at a task force level, we're trying not to be too top down about it. Um, and yeah, so I don't I don't know if that answers your questions. And oh, except Donna, we have not worked with this data science research group, so um, that is great to look at. Or at least as far as I know, I don't. Um, it's possible that some folks in the science library have just dealt with those some of the researchers there for other things, but we haven't, as a task force, uh, brought those folks in. So that's a great group to reach out to. Thank you so much, Anna. Thanks. Thanks to you both. It's Rita. I had to dial in. I'm not sure what happened with my audio. So um, up next, oh, there's the last slide for that. <laughs> Thank Palms you. And go Gators. <laughs> OK, Temple, you're up next. Temple reviewed responses from Caltech. So Margaret um, and Gretchen, the floor is all yours. Um, hi, uh, this is Gretchen, and I'm here with Margaret. Um, so. Um, Caltech. So we looked at the survey and noticed that you've done like an impressive amount, either planned in the planning stage or completed environmental scans and needs assessments. So it looked like you were doing a lot of that, um, those sorts of activities already, and that you'd already participated in the eScience Institute. Um, so um, and it looked like you were maybe on the brink of offering. Uh, sort of education and workshops and things like that. Uh, we were struck by your comments at the last webinar about um, your, that, you know, that you were actively reducing staff and consolidating and definitely not hiring a data librarian. So it seems like your challenge, one of your challenges is around staffing um, and funding. So um, we thought of a couple things that uh, look like good next steps. And one, one would be, you know, looking to your, both to your subject specialist to share the load. Um, uh, so the subject specialist, you know, as it says here on the slide, could be, you know, supporting, you know, DM, DMP tool or DMP planning, um, sorry, data management planning, data repository consultations, et cetera, um, and also provide instruction and information sessions, which we talk about a little bit more. Um, and that along with that, you know, identifying what the staff training needs and interests would be um, to support bringing all the uh, subject specialists um, on board. Uh, so we thought that, um, you know, sort of that one of the, you, you, I think you said you, this was going to be like the fourth, fifth, or sixth thing you were going to do is to develop the, the state, the um, policy around um, around uh, your data services. And we thought maybe you could do that 
sooner and um, develop uh, a statement about the scope of your services. And then in addition to, you know, in doing that, you'd identify who could sort of step up and help support them, but also, you know, look outside the library um, elsewhere on campus and identify who else could fill in those other pieces. Um, and uh, we did want to um, put a plug in for going ahead and doing the workshops and info sessions. Um, sooner rather than later, because in our brief experience um, this past year, we did find that um, Margaret offered a, a few sessions, and they really helped jumpstart the conversation with the faculty. Uh, you can see some of the points here that um, we learned from doing them, and um, I guess we were also interested in starting to claim some territory in this area to sort of let people know we're interested, we're here, um, we're, we're here to support the researchers. So it seemed important to get that out there and to publicize our role in this. Um, Margaret, do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I would just say, um, yeah, offering the workshops was a really great way to get that conversation and to bring people in. Um, and it seems like it's a fairly low cost thing to do. Um, it costs some time and um, you know, even if not a lot of people show up, it still starts to get the word around that you're doing something. Next slide. Um, so yeah, so we also went through the other ones and looked and made a couple of comments about the other uh, survey responses. Um, that's how we read the instructions for today. Um, so for um, Florida, we also noted that um, you guys have done a lot. Um, one of the challenges you noted in the survey was that um, there are a lot of needs and a lot of <laughs> different things that you could do. Um, so we thought, um, you know, having that scope definition, um, or at least doing like Kathleen was talking about, having that who does what list. So you kind of put your um, they can the ground out what, what the library will do and what other departments might do instead. Um, for Richmond, um, you guys noted that um, there's a lot of work involved with um, having an IR or a data repository. Um, so we thought you know, one way that could be um, ameliorated is to have um, some easier data ingestion, have the faculty create the metadata, and then the librarians can review it. Still some work, but not as much work as creating metadata from scratch. Um, and then you also noted that you had some enthusiastic faculty, and that's awesome. Um, so we recommend you focus on and engage with them, and then that will kind of spread out. Um, and then um, Nevada, Las Vegas, um, it kind of seemed like you guys don't really, you're at the starting phases. You said that in the last one, too, which we're also pretty early in our in our stuff here, so we, we feel you. Um, but um, yeah, the same as with um, with Caltech, we really think that having the um, the workshops is a really easy way to get started. There are a lot of tools out there like um, the Nextemic um, curriculum and the Mantra curriculum for um, already planned out presentations you can give. Um, to help get that word out and start the conversation and bring, bringing people to you. Do you want to add anything else, Gretchen? So that's all that we have. Thanks, uh, Gretchen and Margaret. Donna, did you have any comments um, on their recommendations for Caltech? Uh, thank you so much, uh, first off. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I think that, 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 you know, over the last, you know, thinking about this, you know, you're absolutely right. I think that that's probably where we're going to go in terms of leveraging um, our other subject specialists to kind of you know, get trained in this um, and make this part of their consult. I mean, we are so focused on, um, I guess, departmental liaison model, the departmental liaison model here because we're so small. and. You know, I think many of us uh, do have regular interaction with faculty, um, or actually even faculty, uh, you know, department administrators, you know, even more so. Um, 
because you know I've, I've found that you know the the, admin, the group administrators or the group lab managers are the ones that kind of get these questions from students about how do I do this and they're like oh well you got to go to the library and then of course they're the ones that get in touch um, so, so so definitely I think that's a great suggestion that, that equipping our, our subject specialists is the way to go um, the uh, and, and offering workshops um, you know I, I I think uh, that, that is something I think Gail is very much in favor of, and we're going to um, look into that. Um, I mean, right now we just have so much going on that I haven't even thought about, you know, putting together a schedule for of workshops for the summer. Um, but many of us do um, brief presentations to incoming graduate students uh, in, at the beginning of the fall term, and I think, you know, I. I think maybe putting together a handout or mentioning that, you know, while we're we're talking to them, you know, say, you know, hey, by the way, you know, this is something that you're going to have to be aware of. I mean, right now, I feel like that would, you know, that that that's completely easy. And I think for the, I don't know if we'll have time to put anything together for the fall because I think a lot of people are going to be traveling. But definitely, uh, I'm sorry for the summer, but um, I think for the fall, definitely, we will we will work on that. And if um, if anybody, if if y'all at Temple or if anybody else has, I guess, example syllabi of, of what would be covered, say, in a one-hour workshop that they'd be willing to share, um, that would be fantastic. So um, so thank you. Thank you again so much for your feedback. Really, really appreciate it. Anyone else want to um, comment on Temple's recommendations for their institution, or we can move forward and come back to this at the end of the session. I'll pause here for a moment. OK, uh, University of Florida, you were reviewing uh, responses from the University of Richmond. Yeah, hi, this is Hannah, and sorry that uh, Lori and Chelsea were not able to make it today. And also, we have kind of a, I feel like we didn't go into much detail compared to you guys on this. But um, uh, one of the needs and our opportunities that we saw was that University of Richmond is planning to work on pol policy development. And I guess probably since that's just at the top of our mind, we glommed onto that. That's what we've been working on most recently. So as Donna already shared, we have our draft best practices document and are moving forward towards a future policy, and I think that sharing um, you know, what our process is and what your process is and other institutions as well, if, if you're working on those kinds of things, could be very useful. Um, one thing that we are expecting to be useful, although we haven't gotten a lot of input yet, is um, that uh, getting user input even through policy development could be really useful. And again, one more way to kind of engage people and let them know what the libraries are up to. Um, I think we'd seen somewhere on the survey that you were not planning to publish on your um, activities, but I looked at your results again, and I think it was just a specific subset that you were planning, planning not to publish, but um, we were kind of recommending that you do consider publishing um, as another way to reach out not just to other librarians and other folks who are doing similar things at, at other institutions, but to your own researchers. Um, so sorry, that's a little bit brief. No, that's great, Hannah. Um, Lucretia, do you want to comment? Um, yes, and I also have Melanie Hilner here is another member of our team. There are four of us on our team. Uh, OK, we'll need you to speak up just a little bit. OK. Um, well, I think that's a good idea to um, borrow other draft um, best practices documents for policy development. That's kind of where we are right now. We're also just you know, looking for faculty that we might work with in the early stages of this development. So I think that would be very helpful. So thank you for that. Um, and then getting that input as we develop the policy. I think that can be side by side. Uh, regarding the publishing, I'm not quite sure. I know that survey was a little confusing sometimes, and I think maybe we answered that and that we weren't going to publish anything right now, but we certainly mm -hmm. would in the future as we develop our program. Do you have anything to add, Melanie? No. no. Thank you. So thank you very much. Sure. Thank you both. OK, uh, University of Nevada, you uh, took a look at Temple's responses, so the floor is yours. Uh, 
Hi, can you hear me? Hello? We can. Oh, good. Um, okay, so we took a look at Temple, and I feel like Temple is kind of our next step. So um, when we looked at the survey results, we decided to take a stab at what a needs assessment would entail. And being new to needs assessment, we looked up the definition. And um, it's not only doing an environmental scan of your current, in this case, data practices and services, but also identifying ideal or future services that Temple could provide. And then we just came up with general questions because we did a little digging to see what exactly um, is going on at Temple right now as far as what data services they're providing. Um, and these are questions we couldn't answer, but if, if you were going to do a needs assessment, determining things like who would be on the team, um, you know, will it be composed of people from the bottom up or a combination of administrators and identified data specialists, um, and what the goal of that team would be, and then also how long it would last. Um, just typical things when you create an ad hoc team. Um, and some of the uh, gaps that we thought you might encounter at Temple would be like the skills, uh, the resources, and the workplace and culture. I think the next slide, do we have control for that? We, we don't have uh, control. Oh, there we go. Yeah, thank you. So currently, we did you know, a Google search on Temple, and we saw a couple of things happening there. You guys have a, a LibGuide on data management, and um, under the resource support services, there is a uh, plan on how to manage your data. We saw um, a strategic plan from 2012, or 2009 to 2012, that mentioned the institutional repository. And as part of that, um, the idea of providing uh, research data management support surrounding that repository. And I saw that was also on the survey. Uh, and then we looked at Temple in general and saw like there's a center for Asian health data management team. We didn't know what that really consisted of or if that might be an opportunity to um, do outreach or maybe you have done outreach for the Center for Asian Health. And then we were thinking of other um, entities on campus because this is kind of like at our stage right now of potential partners to be on a needs assessment team, like the Office of Sponsored Programs, um, or if there are other initiatives on campus that we didn't quite come up with in our search of the Temple University site. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. And then it's also, I think maybe Temple in some senses like us, where we're trying to figure out what our ideal state is or where we want to be in this research um, data management service game. And then there's some projects that we thought would help, or potential um, pilots that could help inform what that ideal state would be. Um, we did see that there was that repository pilot. And then seeing how research data management services could build into the repository, it looks like right now there's a lot of referrals to already established repositories. And how would this, uh, how would T Temple having their own repository change that? Um, as mentioned with others, like creating information sessions and workshops around research data management. Um, and then focus groups and getting the conversation started and getting the, your name out there. Um, talking with faculty or groups and asking about research data management not only shows that you're interested in them, but it also tells the people that you're interviewing that you are interested in research data management as well. So it's kind of like a twofold of gathering information, but also promoting the library services in this area. Anything else, Sue? No. Thank you, John and Sue. Um, Temple, would you like to come um, comment? Sure. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. Um, I thought it was interesting the last thing you said about doing the um, interviews, because we actually don't have interviews, broad scoped interviews planned, and I think that point about um, using them as an 
opportunity to promote um, our interest in this area and ability to help in this area uh, is, is clever. Um, and uh, Margaret, you can say something about that repository, too. Um, yeah, we're in a weird pilot phase with the repository, as, as you said. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, once that starts really getting going, we'll be able to see how that informs the, the information sessions and the workshops and change how we see the services or, or how it, you know, guides the evolution of the services. I was really interested that you said we have the Center for Asian Health Data Management Team, because that's the first I've heard of it. So we will have to reach out to them. Yeah, this, that was interesting. <laughs> um, and I guess we're happy to say that after this meeting today, after our webinar, we are meeting with um, a representative from the Office of the Vice Provost for Research um, to talk about um, you know, our interests, how we can support you know, um, what they're doing, and and really trying to solidify um, and identify, solidify our relationship with that office and identify um, you know, how we'll work together. So, um, so And I did right. see that. Did you bring in, in, in doing our searches, I saw Kathleen Fitzpatrick came to Temple to talk about yeah. scholarly communication. Was that part of the library that did that or? Yes. Um, I think that was through the library was it through chat. Oh, we have a Center for the Humanities. Uh, I think it, was, it was together or something like that. It was sponsored together. We all did actually a book project where we read her, um, the librarians read her book and then had like a book group, study group. Okay. On, on the, um, the obsolescence that one. In my search for an institutional repository, she came up and I know that she's been talking about some open access type things from, I guess, from MLA or the Modern Language Association. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, um, and that was just got me thinking, like, oh, maybe we could bring in outside speakers to talk about their scholarly communication activities from different disciplines, mm -hmm. if that was the intent. That was. Or maybe it was that. just. <laughs> it wasn't. That's, that's interesting, though. Yeah. Could even just do a webinar. They're a little cheaper. <laughs> So, and I think this idea about defining the team, I think we're kind of on the brink of that. Um, we have some new positions coming on board in the library. Um, and it, I, it appears to me, this is Gretchen speaking, it appears to me that like a lot of things will fall into place over the next six months, probably. When, when you hire people, and this is the question that we're having here, are you making some knowledge about data or research data a preferred in these job searches, especially for like subject librarians? Um, the two positions that we ha are hiring for or have hired for recently um, that relate to this have, one is the scholarly communications that like alludes to this and the other is um, at our health sciences campus um, at that library for a research services person and that was something that I think it, it must have been a preferred thing for that mm -hmm. position as well. Um, but as far as like subject specialists, I don't think that they're including that at this point. Are, but, are you doing that? Oh. We did it for our social science librarian that we are um, in the process of interviewing for. We tried to throw in data oh. in the title. Hey. <laughs> Oh, hold on. <laughs> um, room confusion. Um, but we did we did try to hire for someone for data, but um, I think it was it was one of those positions that Rita sent out that blog for about the sort of over determined position of data librarians in general where we had statistics plus like a little visualization thrown in with like data knowledge and maybe a little research data too. I think it wasn't successful because it was just trying to be too many things at once. And so this time we went with the preferred data route rather than the having it be um, more of an upfront qualification, if that makes sense. Interesting. Yeah. 
Well, thank you again. That's, we'll look at this more closely. Yes, helpful. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay. Last but certainly not least. Uh, University of Richmond, you took a look at UNLV's responses, so the floor is yours. Okay, well this is Lucretia McCulley again. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, all right. Um, this first slide just shows that Richmond was reviewing uh, UNLV's responses to the survey, so you can move on to the next slide. And we identified an opportunity that um, UNLV has leadership. Um, and an emphasis on campus to be a top research uh, university. So we thought it would be good for you to leverage that opportunity to make the case for library RDM services. Uh, we also noticed some parallels uh, with us uh, that we have a new president and a relatively new data services librarian position and a new person in that position. So we just observed that, that there were some parallels with what's going on at, at our campuses. And you can go on to the next slide. So our recommendations were to um, use surveys and interviews to gather data and information about what faculty needs are and what they're doing, but also use the survey and the interview time as an outreach and educational opportunity that you could frame the, the survey as a way to educate people um, as well as get information from them. And then um, we thought it might be good to start with the narrow target population and don't wait until the new RDM position is approved and hired to start. Um, to communicate with colleagues internally too and that's something we've been thinking about here at Richmond that we need to educate our colleagues, the entire library, about what we're thinking in terms of uh, data management and data archiving so that everybody fully understands that. And then um, just identify and reach out to those with RDM expertise within different schools and academic um, units at the university. So that's, that's it. Great. Thank you, Richmond. Um, Sue and John, do you want to comment? So we were really curious to see if you guys picked up on a, a brand new thing that we were recently made aware of called um, CADRA and MyResearcher.org. We've got a very active group in the, is it Urban Studies? Public Administration. Public Administration group who have started, they're designing a really awesome graduate level course about research and they partnered with um, a community, well, a, a company in the area who's doing some really interesting work with community um, level data. And um, we're, we're investigating um, what that means for the rest of campus and um, how we can learn from them and maybe provide services to them as well. And that just popped up on the radar um, in the last couple of weeks? No, last Friday. I'm last sorry. Friday. So we, we um, if we surprised uh, Temple by finding things they hadn't heard about, we were wondering if you guys had picked up on it, <laughs> on our surprises that are, are kind of popping up like, you know, popcorn right, right now. We, we actually met about this two weeks ago because everybody oh, was okay. out of the office. But that's great to know. That's exciting. Yeah, it's, what's interesting about it, and it caught everyone on the library off guard, was they partnered with our supercomputing center and they're advertising like we're doing data management services and um, you know we can help you with that data management plan now and we were kind of like really that's interesting um, that they would offer that all of a sudden out of the blue so we're we're investigating that and trying to see what it means um, and if, you know, we don't want to create like a competing service, but maybe see ways where we could complement their services. Right, it could be a good partnership. Yeah, and I think it's one of those things too, it's like, well, when we say data management, we mean one thing, and when they say data management, it might mean something completely different. Exactly. 
for example, that MyResearcher.com is not freely available. It's a subscription-based service. And um, but I think because they're offering it to free to campus that they believe that they're being open with their data, which I think we're not really agreeing with. And I think they just typed in some of the uh, releases, the news release that we saw um, via UNLV Today, our daily newsletter. Oh, good. You found the login page. Cool. Yeah. We'll take a look at that. Yeah, it's fascinating, and it's, um, you know, I, I don't, I guess I, we aren't surprised that units are, are taking the initiative to create these things, but it's kind of funny when it happens in the midst of this e-research project. <laughs> well, thank you, Richmond and um, Nevada. And um, so we can pause here for further discussion if you like. Um, if you'd like me to back up to a certain slide, anybody want to discuss anything further, please um, just say so. I'm happy to do that. We have plenty of time. I'll just pause here for a moment. You can also use the chat window. Hi, this is Kendall. I um, just have a question for folks. Um, that was kind of brought up by that last comment with the um, the researcher um, dot com my research researcher dot com. Um, I'm wondering for when you have other centers on campus that are offering data management, whatever they mean by that um, options. What um, what does the library um, or or you know offer that perhaps those other um, centers with that type of expertise might not. So I, I, I'm wondering um, if folks have, have thought about that or in settings where you've had to justify um, what the library offers as opposed to other other services. This is uh, John again. Um, so what we're finding is that um, it's like a culture of yes and then there's no follow-up. So our supercomputing center says they offer data management services, and this cadre is saying that they offer it too. But outside of the newsletter, the news announcement where this occurred, there's really no, um, you can't go to a web page and find like data management services. And unless it's, you know, happen to know by word of mouth that um, our supercomputing center is doing this, you really, you would just never know that they offer it. And we haven't really had a test case to see what they offer. So I think that's the stage we're at is to where, where does the rubber meet the road and how far are they going with their research data management support. So they're saying that, yes, they do all of these things, but what does it truly mean when they say that they offer these services? And I think that's the point we're at right now. Anyone else? Um, this is Margaret at Temple. I would say here at least what we're aware of that people are doing um, for so-called research data management um, is either really ad hoc where it is sort of like you have to know the right person and the secret password and all that stuff. Um, so there's there are barriers there that the library wouldn't have. Um, also, you know, if they go to, say, computer services and want a place to store their data, they're going to be like, oh, go to Box. We have a Box account for you. And that's not open, so we offer openness. We're also, you know, we're not, at least we aren't intending to be, um, you know, focused on one discipline, so it's open to everybody. Um, so I think the library can offer those kinds of things. We also, as librarians and as people who are invested in this in perhaps a different way than some other units, we understand like the importance of metadata and the importance of preservation. Um, there was a conversation here that the last time that anyone talked about this, computer services thought they were doing preservation because they save things for two years and then they get rid of it. So it's sort of, you know, we, we offer something that they don't know is a thing and that, <laughs> that can be a a good thing, I guess. 
Thanks, Margaret. Anybody else would like to make a comment? Feel free. Okay, well, um, certainly feel free to keep the conversation going in the chat room and also in our Clear Connect community if you feel so inclined. Um, I want to thank again our guest speaker, Kathleen Fear from the University of Rochester, and our eResearch Network faculty and fellows that are here today. And of course, thanks to all of you that participated in today's webinar and that um, did a great job on the group activity. I think it was very um, informational for me and hopefully for all of you as well to see the similarities of the problems that you're all working on, but also the diversity of problems that you're all working on uh, with regards to research data management services. So uh, with that, our next webinar is July the 15th. That's a Wednesday. Uh, 1 o'clock Eastern, and the topic is library instruction, faculty and student engagement. And we'll have two guest speakers, Donna Caffell and Elaine Martin with the NECDEM uh, curriculum. Just a reminder that our DLF forum is this October, 26 through 28. Uh, we really strongly encourage you to collaborate on a panel uh, or a presentation or submit uh, a proposal of your own. The call for proposals does uh, end on the 22nd of June. I did post a message about this yesterday or um, Monday in the Clear Connect community and in the Google group as well. Um, if you need any kind of information about um, collaborating with uh, members of the former cohort, you know, a, a list of those participants, anything like that, please let me know. And those folks are also in our Google group. So um, just a reminder to, to take advantage of those two lines of communication, the Google group and Clear Connect. So unless there are questions or other comments for the group or uh, about the webinar in general or anything for me um, with regards to Clear or the eResearch network, I, I will we'll close off this session a little bit early and give you back a few minutes of your day. And um, it was a very helpful session. And feel free to send me an email if there's anything you need. And thank you all again. Great, thanks.